how to put their uniform on properly. And, and so we send them off for basic training. Their muscles are underdeveloped. They don't have endurance and physical strength that time. They're soldiers in name, but we need to make them soldiers in reality. And it's, it's very important for them to actually go and get this training. It's not just done for frivolous purposes. They need to do this because one thing that they have to learn is that when they go out into the battlefield, they are fighting against an enemy that has one objective. We know what that objective is. The enemy is trying to kill our soldiers. And, and so when a, a soldier is being trained, they have to come to a place of understanding. This is not a game, it's not something frivolous. It is actually a life and death struggle. Wars aren't fought nine to five, Monday to Friday. When you're at war, you don't stop for a coffee break and you don't take a three week vacation and, and you don't have a nice lunch spread out for you at, at 12 o'clock. War is fought in a manner where when you are at the front line, the enemy is coming at you at all times. And it is crucial that soldiers understand that this is the way war is fought. If a soldier gets hurt, if one does need a rest, the commander has to figure out how to replace that soldier at the front because the enemy doesn't stop, say, oh, we hurt somebody, therefore we'll, we'll give you a chance to fix them up. When they hurt somebody, then they're coming with f more force. It encourages the enemy. And they will come even harder. And so war isn't fought according to gentlemanly rules and, and things that, that are nice and convenient. It's war. And our recruits, soldiers, have to learn to fight, and they have to learn quickly. And so it is with every new Christian. If you have just come to know the Lord, and you are starting your walk with Christ. You do need to understand that you have entered into a war. And everything you know about war applies to your Christian life. Everything you have heard of, all the negatives, the privations, the hardships, the sacrifices that soldiers go through to try to, to protect that which is precious to us. It applies to us in our Christian lives. Most folks, when they get saved, they are just bubbling. They are so happy and joyful and smiling, and they love everybody, and they, they want to hug everybody, and it's just a wonderful time. And that's great. That is wonderful. But we then need to grab a hold of you and say, okay, now uh, enjoy this. It's like when you get married or when you start a new job or it could be a new prime minister, there's a time that's called the honeymoon period. And, and that's wonderful. Everybody's smiling and happy. The couple is all thrilled with each other and, and they can do nothing wrong. That is the honeymoon period. And I, I want to let you know marriages don't uh, marriages aren't just about honeymoons. That's a very short period of time at the beginning of your marriage. And then you get into real life. When we come to Christ, we need to enjoy all of the wonderful bliss that we enter into as children of God. But we do also need to understand that our enemy, Satan, Lucifer, the devil, whatever it is you want to call him, is very upset that he has lost a part of his territory. That's you. You were once a part of his territory. You were once a part of his kingdom. And when he loses you, he and his evil angels get together and they try to put their hats, their plans, and get their act together to come back after that territory they have lost, which happens to be you. So you need to learn how to fight quickly. Now, Paul wrote uh, the, the passage we read to the Ephesians somewhere around 60 AD at a time when Rome was the imperial power of the world. And so wherever you would see a Roman soldier, 
uh, this, this, this would just strike fear into the hearts of these people in the occupied lands and in those who were, were fighting Rome. Rome was the power on the earth. And, and so Paul, as a good teacher, was looking at these soldiers and he said, I can use this. I can, I can use the way a soldier puts himself together as an example, as a teaching aid to help those who I'm trying to reach. And so if you can uh, help us, uh, Brother Chad, let's see what these Roman soldiers look like. Probably have a little picture there. Now, uh, right, right in the middle there, you see that little picture, you can put it up for me. From our scripture reading, there are, are seven aspects of how a soldier was put together that we want to talk about and we want to think of. Seven, as you know from scripture, is a, a, a number of completion, a number of, of accomplishment. It's a number of perfection. And so in this, and this makes it easy, we have seven days in the week. I would encourage you to take one of these for each of the seven days and, and just meditate on each of these seven aspects of what it takes to be part of, of this, this army of, of God. Now, what, what it takes to be a soldier that is ready and prepared. And it's not Brother Chad's fault. I didn't warn him beforehand. I just sort of slipped that picture in there. But being the brilliant uh, guy that he is, I, I, I know he'll, he'll get to that. And, and you'll see what these soldiers look like. We read in the scripture that the first thing we need to be concerned with, and I'm going to give you all seven very quickly and give you your homework assignment, then I'll go through them uh, a little more slowly that we can talk about them. The truth of the word of God is our basic core defensive armor. And as you'll see, we have three defensive uh, armaments. We have three offensive weapons, and we have one that is both offensive and defensive. And so the truth of the word of God is our basic core defense. And, and then righteousness is an offensive weapon. You may not have thought of it as such, but it is. It's an offensive weapon that protects that which is most vital to us. And then sharing the gospel is another offensive weapon that we have that protects us against Satan's assaults. And the reality of our salvation is a defensive armament that protects our minds. And then the word of God, it's a powerful offensive weapon that we use against our enemy. Then the last one, spirit-led prayer is both offensive and defensive. We pray as we're going into battle. We pray for our fellow soldiers, our brothers and sisters, that God would defend them, protect them, and strengthen them, and of course, ourselves. These are seven things that we need. So here's your assignment. Every morning, well, it starts today. You have read once through our, our text. And so today's assignment is to think about, meditate on the truth of the Word of God that is at our core. And every day up to Saturday, you take one of these elements of our armor, the things we need to fight spiritual warfare, the weapons that we have at our disposal. And we will talk about these and think about them and meditate on them as we go through the week. So now we go back to the top. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth. If you've done any kind of a workout program, you'll, you'll have been taught about your core, your abs, you know, your abdominal muscles, your lower back muscles. Uh, you talk about strengthening your core. These muscles protect your spine, your liver, your kidneys, your, your stomach, your intestines, your reproductive uh, uh, system. And, and this is your core. And, and these muscles are needed for balance, for posture, for flexibility. You can't run, you can't walk, you can't stand, you can't sit without your core muscles being involved. We cannot 
ignore our core. I, I was reading about soccer players one day. They said, you know, the thing that a soccer player needs more than anything else is a strong core. That's where their endurance comes from. We need a core. So what is our core? Our core is the truth of the word of God. Having our waist girded with truth. Uh, this, these core muscles are protecting organs inside that are mainly responsible for eliminating toxins from our body, our liver, our kidneys, our intestines. They, they get rid of junk. They, they purify uh, what goes in and get rid of toxins that could really harm us. That's what the Word of God does. The Word of God protects our core. The Word of God is like uh, Paul said in the same book of Ephesians, chapter 5. It's, he says we need, to be, uh, we need the washing of water by the Word. It's a purifying agent. The Word of God purifies us. And so we start by protecting our core with truth. The truth of the Word of God. Sanctify them by your truth, Jesus prayed in John 17. Thy Word is truth. And then we put on the breastplate of righteousness. The soldier's breastplate covered his rib cage. And, of course, that's another very important part of the human skeletal system. The rib cage protects a couple of very, very vital organs, our heart and our lungs. Now, can I tell you, you're not going to live long if your heart and your lungs aren't functioning. If you can't breathe, there's nothing going into your lungs, you'll die very quickly. If your heart isn't pumping life-giving, well-oxygenated blood through your system, you're going to die very quickly. And that's what righteousness does in our Christian lives. Now, unrighteousness, the opposite of righteousness, is when we are deliberately, knowingly, consistently doing what we know is wrong. That's unrighteousness. Deliberately, consistently, knowingly doing what we know is wrong, that's unrighteousness, and that will kill us. It will kill us quickly. We can't be Christian soldiers living in unrighteousness. The breastplate of righteousness protects our heart. It protects our lungs. It allows us to live. Now, uh, as, as you will see, there are some things that uh, as we go from our core to our, our heart, and then, of course, we'll come to our head, we're talking about things that we can't live without. Things that if they fail us, we will die. Righteousness is crucial for us. It is an offensive weapon that we use in fighting the enemy. We need to have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We talked about righteousness, living a consistent, godly Christian life. And we need to do that as a witness to the world of the life-changing power of God. But we also need to speak. We need to share with others the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's good news. That's what the word gospel means. Good news. And we need to share this good news with everybody we meet. Now, what's the good news? Jesus died in our place at Calvary and paid the penalty for our sins. I don't have to endure eternal death and separation from God because Jesus took my place. Now, that is very good news, folks. <laughs> that is very good news. We are dealing with a holy, righteous God. And no sin can stand in his presence. I could not stand in his presence in my sin. But he took it all away. Nailed it to his cross. And I want to thank God for the gospel. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15. And he laid it out. He said, here's the gospel. The death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus died in our place. 
and then he was buried. We don't talk about that often. You go, well, you know, if someone dies, they're buried. But uh, it, it's part of this gospel, one of the three legs that it stands on. And what does burial speak to us about? Well, it verifies the fact that the one buried is dead. You don't bury someone who's alive. There are some who, who said, well, you know, Jesus didn't really die on the cross. He, he went into a coma. He had lost so much blood, and he just passed out and all of that. Well, even if he wasn't dead on the cross, which he was, the Roman soldiers verified that, and believe me, they were killing machines. They knew when you were alive, and they knew when you were dead. But then they took Jesus from the cross, and they prepared his body for burial. They, they got some blanks, uh, sheets and, and wraps, linen and all of that, and they put these spices around his body, and then they wrapped him up like a mummy. And if he hadn't died on the cross, certainly he died of suffocation. Uh, by the time they were done with him, 150 pounds of spices and wrapping this all around, he, if you can't breathe, you're dead. And, and then they buried him. And uh, some of you have been to funeral services. You know the finality of a burial. Uh, when someone dies, there are those who will gather around uh, those who are dead. And, and we, we have faith and hope that God will even raise the dead. But there's something about a burial that, that just sort of nails it. It's over. It's, it's done. They are buried. And the importance of that for us is that that's what's happened with our past, with our sins, with our shame, our guilt, all the things that were keeping us from God. They were nailed to the cross and they were buried in the tomb. They are not coming back. We can, some, I thought someone would be happy about that. They're not coming back. When I stand before God, none of the things I did in the past are going to be brought up to me. They're dead, and they're buried with Christ. And I am very thankful for that. I am very thankful for that. Some of you may have lived under great loads of guilt and shame for what you have done. I'm here to tell you that the gospel works when you give that to Jesus. Say, Lord, forgive me. He says, done. <laughs> Actually, it was done 2,000 years ago. It's just for us to receive it and accept it for ourselves personally. And that's where our response to him, our prayer is so important. We say, God, please forgive me. And he says, I have taken care of that. You never have to worry about that. Now, this enemy we're talking about, the devil and his angels, they will frequently bring your past up before you. Anyone ever experienced that? But you have the gospel. You have the gospel. Hey, Jesus died for my sins. They are nailed to his cross. They were buried in a tomb. They are gone and will never be brought up against me by him. And by the way, Satan, he's the only one that matters because he is the judge, the only wise judge. He is the one we stand before. And when he looks at me through Christ... There's nothing on my docket. I am saved. But then it didn't end there. It's not just that Jesus died and was buried. The best part is he rose again. <laughs> wow. Now, uh, let, let me just put a little insert uh, here. Uh, what we are talking about is a historic fact. Now, there are things we may not know, things we may not understand. Uh, but, but there are, uh, we, we deal with those things we don't know and understand on the basis of what we do know. I, I look at this congregation, I could call so many names, and, and I, I see Sister Velma Grant before me. Now, I know she exists. I, I could be a thousand miles from home, but if someone says, uh, that Velma Grant, is, is, is she a real person? Absolutely, she's a real person. How do you know? Well, I've met her, I've seen her. Now, there are others I have not met and seen, but I believe they're real people. I have heard of a man by the name of Justin Trudeau. 
And if you ask me, is he a real person, I would say, yes, he's a real person. Well, how do you know? Well, there are many, many, many people who have seen him, talked to him, uh, recorded what he had said. They have reported it to me. And I believe he exists. Now, I've never seen him, but I, I actually do believe he exists. And that's how history works. There are things like the life of Christ that are not going to be duplicated. Jesus isn't here in the flesh today. But do I believe that Jesus Christ is a real person? I didn't say was, I said is. Do I believe that Jesus Christ is a real person? Absolutely. Why do I believe he's a real person? Because there were multiplied thousands who saw him, talked to him, touched him, felt him. They saw him crucified on Calvary. They took him to the tomb and they buried him and with their own eyes they saw and experienced the risen Christ. He rose from the dead. I believe it. I have it on really good evidence. Now, at some point, it's very important if you have questions to sit down and read the evidence and think about the evidence that, that is abundant about the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, when we, so, so there are those who, who have come to that understanding. We talk about God, and this God, whoever, wherever, decided to come to earth in hum, human form, in the person of Jesus Christ. So he has become the center point of history. If Jesus was God, and all these things that we can talk about prove that he was who he said he was. And we have to deal with it. Now, there are th some who, who, are, uh, who describe themselves as atheists, and they don't believe the gospel, this Jesus stuff. It's just a myth and a fable. Uh, but, but I hope everyone here will at least be intellectually honest enough to accept the history of the, the evidence that history has given us of the reality of Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, and his resurrection, which proves to us that he is, in fact, God. Now, there are some things about God I don't understand. There are some things about God I, I just can't figure out. But I know that he is. And this is how we, we, we come to, uh, to this place of of uh, when we talk about the gospel and what Jesus did, we know it's real. We know that God is. In fact, we take the shield of faith, and, and this helps us to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And what does faith do for us? Well, first, faith is the way we live life. We, we only live life by faith. Without faith, we'd be dead. We have faith in the air we breathe, the food we eat, we have faith in the doctors. Uh, good to see you, doctor. Uh, he's just coming in. Uh, uh, when, when Brother Dan gives you a prescription, you go and you fill the prescription, and you have faith that he knows what he's doing, and you put those drugs in your body. You have faith in the bank where you put your money. You have faith in that pilot that's flying the plane, and you have faith in the plane that it's going to take you to your vacation destination. Everything in life is based on faith. I had faith in this woman who told me she loved me. And so I said, okay. And I made vows to her, signed on the dotted line, and we've been living together for 30 years, all based on faith. The things that are most important are based on faith. I can't see her love. I can't weigh it. I can't put it under a microscope. I believe it. I've experienced it. It's real. That's what God says we need if we're going to serve him. Hebrews chapter 11. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. That's how God has set our life up to be. We live by faith. We live by faith. And our faith must be in God. Now, faith is that, that understanding, that knowledge, as Webster would say, a complete trust or confidence in someone or something. Complete trust trust and confidence in someone or something that causes us to make life-altering decisions because of faith. 
God demands that we have faith. This kind of faith, complete, unwavering faith in God, is what quenches all the fiery darts of doubt that the enemy likes to throw at us. <laughs> Do you really believe that stuff? I, I was uh, watching something the other day. Someone twigged me to this thing on YouTube. It's a fellow by the name of Bill Mahar, I believe it's pronounced. I'm M-A-H-E-R. And, and so he, he's a talk show host, and he was interviewing a Christian. And this gentleman, Mahar, is an atheist, self-described, hates everything to do with religion and, and, and God and the Bible. It's all, I mean, he's a very anti-God. And, and, uh, and an atheist is one who actually says there is no God. So it's not even, I don't know, maybe, maybe not, I'm, I don't know. An atheist says there is no God. And, and of course, that in and of itself is just such a phenomenal statement to make. You are so smart. You have proven beyond any shadow of a doubt for all time and for all history throughout the whole universe that there is no God. So he's, you know, these are brilliant people brilliant people that can prove that there is no God. And now, as I say, there are things about God we may not know and we may not understand. But, but folks, from what we have experienced, from what we have seen, from what history has taught us, from the life of Jesus Christ, if we are going to be intellectually honest, we have got to admit that there is a God. If we look at this universe... If we look at our own bodies, the things that are made, we do a Romans 1 kind of study, we can't come to any other conclusion that this didn't all just happen. I can't explain where God came from. I have to accept what he tells me, that he's without beginning and end. He's real. He does, I mean, he can bring himself back to life from the dead. That's... He's God. And so my faith is in him. Now, now, as simplistic as that might sound to some of you brilliant people, it's just a matter of fact that even when you can't understand something and even when you, you might not like something, we have to at least be honest enough to say it is. I might not like some of the things that my dear sister Velma says or does, uh, I might not understand some of the things she says or does, but I cannot deny the fact that she is. That's the basis of our faith in God. He that comes to God must believe that he is. Amen. The shield of faith that allows us to say, like Job, I know my Redeemer lives. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. That's the shield of of faith. Then we take the helmet of salvation. Now, the helmet protects the skull. The skull protects the brain. The brain is the, the, the control center for everything that happens in our bodies. So it's very important that our brain is in good shape. Our, and our brain is this thing. Now, I, actually, I don't know where it is. We have this thing that's called the mind. It's not a physical entity. Uh, and I can't explain it to you, but, but all that really is important about us, you, know, you can have a brain but no mind. Does that make sense? Your brain can be non-functional, and you are comatose, you are in a vegetative state, your mind is blown, as we would use the term, so, so there's a, a difference. What we want to have is the mind of Christ, but the way our mind works, it sort of works through our brain and sends instructions all through our, our bodies. And we need to protect our brain, our mind, our thinking. And how do we do that? Through the reality of our salvation. Really? You know, there's an old song that uh, we used to sing, well, somebody used to sing years ago. It says, I'm saved and I know that I am. I'm do you know that song, Sister Elise? Yeah, so it's, it's a real song. Sister Elise knows it. 
I'm saved and I know that I am. And I, that's all I, I know of the song. I can't remember anything else. But just that one line tells me something that I and we need to know. I'm saved and I know that I am. That is what, that's the control center at work. I'm saved. Now, if I wasn't saved and I didn't know it and I, I was in doubt and I didn't have any, any concept of, of that, I'd be a miserable person. In fact, and I, and I, I don't say this lightly, uh, when, I, when I made my commitment to Christ at 19 years of age, I, it really was very important to me because I was starting to see the world. I'd left home for the first time, and I was starting to see the world in a different way. Uh, when you're a kid growing up, everything's fine, you know, your good times are good, your bad times aren't really all that bad. But then you start to realize that there are people your age who go off to war and get killed. There are diseases that kill people. There are, there are uh, politicians and corrupt business leaders that mess up your life. And, and I mean, it, it was just, uh, this was starting to come to me. And as a young man with a very idealistic view of the world, that was very depressing, very depressing. And I, I, I mean, God in his goodness, uh, he has been blessing me all my life. I was blessed to be born into a home where the Bible was paramount. I learned the things of God. I, I had a clear idea of, of what the word of God had to say about me, about life, about uh, the past, the present, and the future. And that kept me from the, uh, the kind of depression that would make somebody kill themselves. Now, there are lots of young people who actually take their own lives because of depression, because what they see out there, what they know and understand, is they say, no, 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 no. I can't live in a world like this. Now, personally, I can live in a world like this because I have the hope the knowledge, the reality of my salvation. I'm in the hands of God. And whatever happens in this world, I can't control that. But one thing I know, I'm saved. And I know that I am. That protects my brain, my thinking, that I can function in a proper manner because I have the helmet of salvation. That knowledge and that reality keeps my head on straight. Amen, amen, amen. We use the sword of the Spirit, huh, the Word of God. Wow, we talked about truth, which is the truth of the Word of God, and, and, and how that's a defensive weapon. Now here it is as an offensive weapon. We speak the Word of God. If you have been to this church for more than one service, you've probably heard this. There is no substitute for the Word of God. You can't live, survive, thrive as a Christian without an intimate knowledge of the Word of God. A scripture like we read this morning has to be memorized. I mean, this needs to be coming into your thinking at all times. It explains our enemy. We're not fighting against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. We need to know that. And then we need to know how to defeat it. It's with the word of God. Jesus was in the wilderness, fasted 40 days, and Satan came and tempted him. Now, the temptation took place throughout these 40 days. Three of them are mentioned to us, and we don't know exactly at what point they came, but, but we have representative temptations, and we see through Jesus' response a representation of how we defeat temptation. And how did Jesus overcome temptation? With the word of God. Turn these stones into bread. Ah, man shall not live by bread alone. Uh, well, you know... Um, Bow down and worship me. Oh, you should only worship the Lord your God. And Satan got smart. He started to use scripture too. Well, the Bible says, Jesus, if you jump off, you know, this, this uh, 
tower, uh, his angels will undergird you. He starts to quote Psalm 91 to him. The Lord said, don't tempt the Lord. Don't test the Lord. He quoted another scripture. So knowing scripture and interpreting scripture properly, that's the sword of the spirit, the word of God. When you read about Jesus in Revelation, it says, out of his mouth came what? A sharp two-edged sword. His word is a sword. Hebrews tells us that, that it, it, it's a sword that, that, that divides. It's a two-edged sword that cuts and divides, divides soul, spirit, bone, marrow. This word of God gets in everywhere. It is a sword of the spirit. It is a weapon that we have to use. So Jesus was weak in the flesh, and we don't fight according to carnal means. We don't use carnal weapons. It's not the strength of our arms and legs. It's not how fast we can flick a sword or pull a gun. It is spiritual warfare, and we fight it with the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Get that Word on board. Amen. Thy Word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. In every situation, we ask ourselves, what does the Word of God say about this? And that's how we proceed. Finally, we pray. We pray. There are a lot of things we don't know, see, or understand, but we pray, and we ask God to help us. And he sees the things we can't see, he knows the things we don't know, and he is here to help us. We want to be a church that's known for prayer. If you haven't done it ever, once a month, you go out and on our prayer board, indicate the hour or hours during the month you'll be praying. Why? Because if you don't pray, <laughs> you're fighting this on your own steam and your own power. We need to say, God, help me. God, strengthen me. God, strengthen my brother, my sister. God, there are things I don't know, I don't see, but you see and you know. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. There are things that are beyond our ability, beyond our control, beyond our power to do. Lord, jump in and help us. And let's stand together as we bring our time together to a close. Let's pray. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you today. Thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you, Lord, that you have called us to serve in your army. We understand, Lord, that we don't fight according to human, uh, the, the human way of fighting. We don't come with carnal weapons. We don't come with guns and knives and spears and grenades. We come with prayer. We come with faith. We come with the Word of God. We come, Lord God, with an understanding of the gospel, the good news of your salvation. We pray today, Lord God, that you would help us to live, to fight, to work, to win others, to draw others to you, to do everything in our power for your light to be seen and shed abroad in this world. Be with us now, we pray, Lord God. We worship you. We bless you. We give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen.